Yes. Yes, and Athena has reminded me a couple times to once the meeting starts to also remind folks that the meeting is being recorded. So I will do that again once we call the meeting to order, which are you good with me um, doing that now, Jennifer? Yes. Okay, great. I'm trying to let Dr. Shabazz in. It's not moving over. All right. Well, while you do that, I am going to call to order the December 19th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 2.03 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And uh, this meeting is being recorded. So welcome everyone. Welcome Dr. Shabazz. So before uh, we're gonna do our sound check and I just started that, but <laughs> Dr. Shabazz didn't respond. So let's start with um, uh, Dr. Rhodes. Can you hear us and can we hear you? I definitely can hear you, and I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes, good. And Yvonne? Yes, I can hear you, and you can hear me with my so sore voice. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sick. Oh, well, thank you for being here. Um, Alexis? Alexis, reporting for duty. Okay. And Dr. Shabazz. <laughs> Shabazz present. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Um, so as I said, Ms. Bridges will not be here. Um, uh, Hala may, may be coming, but I, I'm not sure. So we'll just keep our eyes out. And I'm going to do a quick review of our agenda and then just pause to see if there are any member comments before we move into things. And Jennifer, can you be heard and 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 hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right. So today it looks like we um, do not have any minutes that we will be approving. Uh, we will be um, following back up on our engagement and consultation campaign, including an update on our, li our listening session. Um, we'll also be discussing our community survey and have some updates on that. And then you all should have received something in your email, a recommendation that came from the AACE uh, at UMass. And so uh, if you haven't received that for some reason, please let me know. It is part of the public packet as well. Um, and we'll have a chance to have a discussion about that. And we haven't really come to any sort of conclusion on the League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee, the collaboration with that group. So I did want to follow up so that I could get back to Meg on that. I know we discussed it in part last week, but I don't recall that we came to a solid conclusion on that one. Um, so let me just pause and see if there are any general member comments right now before we move into the agenda. All right. Uh, yes, Alexis. Well, I guess I, I did not receive the AAC recommendations, um, but if it's like included in this packet, yeah, I see it here. Okay. So I don't, I don't need it sent again, but. Okay, perfect. I do want to make sure though, why maybe you didn't receive it. Um, hmm. I can look into that after Alexis. I just want to make sure you are receiving everything that I'm I'm sending. So maybe it went into uh let's see here. Did everyone else receive it? Definitely. Okay. Um Alexis, I'm just looking at the email now and I I sent it to 
uh, alexis at amherstmedia.org. And that was on December 12th at 2.59 p.m. Um, so it's in the packet now, but just so if you want to make sure I'm getting messages. <laughs> It was on a thread and they sometimes get bunched and you don't. Hi, welcome, Hala. Can you hear us? Okay. 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 Yes, I can hear you. All right, any other general comments before we move into the agenda? Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. I would like to show you um, I have been working with Jennifer, Athena, and Brianna um, about the upcoming listening session. There were a lot of pieces that we needed to work through to ensure that we were not in violation of open meeting law and that we were um, setting up the right sort of meeting. Um, so just to give you a quick overview about the way that's going to work is it's been set up as uh, let me pull up the Engage Amherst page here. Can you all see my screen? Okay. So uh, you will see that we've created a new postcard here um, that includes our special guest, Congressman Jim McGovern. Um, it includes the day and time, obviously. What we've decided to do is to direct folks to this Engage Amherst page where uh, the webinar link will be available here. So we didn't put the webinar link onto any of the material materials that will be circulating. But essentially, this is going to be set up as a webinar. So if you think about a town council meeting, it's going to be set up like a town council meeting is. Um, we'll all have panelist invites. And so we'll be panelists along with the congressman, um, initially at least. And then everybody else is going to be in the audience. And when a person would like to make, when and if a person would like to make a comment during the listening session component, they'll raise their hand and they will be brought in and they will be seen and heard if they choose to be. So they can turn their camera off, um, but if they would like to be seen, they will be promoted to a panelist so that they can be seen and heard. Um, and then when they are finished with their comment, they'll go back into the audience. This will also be getting streamed through various different channels, including Amherst Media, YouTube, Facebook, um, so that, that those pieces are all in place. So right now, what we really need to focus on is getting this circulated. Brianna is going to be putting this out to all of her media channels. She's got an entire list that's going to be on the community calendars. Um, I believe Brianna said that she would set it up so that folks who are subscribed will receive an alert that the event is happening. I see Jennifer shaking her head. Um, a press release will go out to all of the media. Um, and then, of course, we'll be sending it to our lists through the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts, through um, our own portal and the list that we have there, and then the running list of folks that I that I have. And you all can send this out to your folks, too, um, so that we can, I think we really want to try to get, um, obviously, as many folks to attend this session as possible. Um, and so our job right now, I think, is really to get the news out. Um, so let me just pause and see if there are any questions about the format or about getting this publicized. Questions, thoughts, ideas. Okay. All right, great. And then I'm going to continue to share my screen here. Um, you should see now a Twitter 
feed. <laughs> uh, sorry, I never thought I would bring Twitter on <laughs> to <laughs> one of our um, meetings here, but this and Dr. Shabazz, I'm looking for your input here. Have you seen this here, um, this one pager on the five injuries of slavery defined? Yes, I have. Okay. And do you endorse this? Does this feel, um, I believe it comes right from NCOBRA. Yes, that is the NCOBRA list of uh, five injury areas. Yes. Okay. So if everybody's comfortable with this, we can use this as the basis for our initial brief educational program that we'll offer at the beginning of the listening session. And I think what we want to do is really allow this to be a prompt for people who may want to make comment regarding any of these injury areas. Um, so we have peoplehood, education, health, criminal punishment, and wealth and poverty. And I did hear from Hala that um, Hala would like to cover health if if that if if nobody else um, if that works for everybody else. And so I would imagine that others will choose one of these areas and will be able to offer some brief comments on an area that feels um, either resonant to you or uh, that you just have an interest in discussing or, or are willing to discuss. So does anyone wanna call out what they, which one of these they would be interested in covering? And I'm wondering, Dr. Shabazz, if you would want to, so I'm thinking it would be, I'll sort of be moderating things so that there are six of uh, six of, of six remaining members. If Dr. Shabazz wants to give an overview of the five injury areas potentially, and then individual members can choose one of the areas. And I see Alexis's hand is raised. I don't it Maybe I'm wrong. Was Dr. Rose going to, I think Dr. Rose was, didn't raise yeah. his hand, but I think that he was about to speak. So I'll, I, I can defer. I, I just, I, I wanted to see the rest of those five injury areas. I, I could only see part of them. So if you could scroll down. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the one that I would definitely want to do is uh, education. Awesome. That's great. And Alexis? Um, uh, well, I, I would like, I'm, I'm interested in personhood as well as wealth and poverty um, in that order. But if somebody else feels ways about either of those. Um, I, I was going to uh, volunteer for wealth and poverty. Great. Okay. And we have held, so that leaves um, Dr. Shabazz or uh, Ms. Bridges with crim criminal punishment. Dr. Shabazz, what's your sense on that? Well, so again, I was happy to just limit myself to, if you, per your um, request for just overview, but um, the, um, but, but so, but wherever I can fill in is fine. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk to Ms. Bridges and see, you know, in terms of engagement, what um, what she might be interested in. And there are other components of the program as well. So I know that you've expressed um, criminal punishment as something of interest to you as well, Dr. Shabazz. So sure. um, yes, Dr. Rhodes. I would like for us when we do this, uh, all of our comments, even the introductory ones, that we limit ourselves to a maximum of three minutes. Otherwise, it's still... Yeah. Sorry, I had to grab a, a glass of a cup of water, but yes, that sounds reasonable. Now, otherwise, we will, it, could, it could go on and on, and, and we need to limit ours so that we can leave a lot more time for the audience to respond. Absolutely. And I will send you all a blank slide deck with our logo and all of that kind of stuff um, so that we'll be able to, um, let me just, I'm going to stop the share because I'm noticing that we have an attendee who has their hand raised. Um, 
And so uh, we have a couple attendees with their hand raised. So I'm going to uh, just, we'll sort of finish this out for a second and then I'm gonna call for public comment um, and allow the two folks who have their hand raised to make public comment. So any other, any other questions or comments about this piece so far? Um, yep. The only thing I'm wondering is since the injury areas are more or less a prompt for discussion and discussion can, can range, the only other thing that it occurred to me is, again, and, and sort of depending on our strategy here um, in terms of the remaining months before our report is due of, of sessions, is whether to um, maybe only highlight one uh, and, you know, we can share all five, but just highlight one and then open, open the floor, uh, you know, uh, a, a little quicker. I, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Rhodes in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the purpose is to listen, should be more about listening. And, um, and, and, and really, if we did focus on one, we could even kind of cure it, you know, get an advanced word out for particular uh, community members or constituencies that may have ideas pertinent to that. Final thing I'll say is wealth poverty, as I um, have understood it through many and COBRA discussions and whatnot, hinges a lot on the idea of disparities in in land and home ownership. Um, and so I just would would kind of note note that that point. It's not the only way to conceive of of wealth and 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 poverty and the wealth gap, but um, but but for most people, uh, the ability to, you know, coming to own land, coming to own your own own home is is the main form of wealth building and equity building. So I just highlight that as well. Great. Uh, what do other what do other members think about focusing doing an, a broad overview of all five, and then focusing this one up on one area for this session? Uh, Alexis, um, I guess I'm wondering how I, I'm. This is not me being against it at all. I, I think that it's nice to kind of like have a scope. Um, but also, I guess I'm wondering how many of these we're going to have before our time is up. And also, um, how often we're going to have them. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's my question. I think that's a really good question. And I think um, we we had originally thought about having a listening session to cover each area, but I think that we are going to need to have listening sessions that cover other things like eligibility criteria and things like that. So my concern is, my preference would be that we do all five, but keep them short to prompt. And then maybe um, if we notice Dr. Shabazz that like we did in the first listening session, a lot was coming up about education in that one. If we notice that something is moving or flowing in one direction, then maybe that would be the opportunity for a member to um, offer additional information about that particular injury area. I think last time what happened is people did eventually warm up and speak, but there wasn't really a framework or a prompt for folks. And so they didn't really know what to speak to. And a lot of times I think people like these injury areas, we've been looking at them for months, but some people don't even know where they where the injury is occurring or that the, that area of injury even exists, you know, depending on where you're coming from. So um, does that work for everybody? If we, if we sort of do a general, a quick overview of each and then, um, tap into the room and the flow and see where things are going. And if we're heading in one direction, we can sort of follow up on one more in the, in the meeting. 
Mm. Or Dr. Shabazz, would you, do you, is there one that you would like us to, um, do you have one in mind that you thought maybe we should focus on or was just a different structure? No, really uh, more question of strategy. I think Alexis's question does still come back to us in terms of, you know, thinking through the coming months, January, February, March, April, May, June, we need to kind of be in final writing mode, proofreading and, and getting ready to, to, to present to, uh, you know, meet our deadline. And so really, it's just a matter of, of thinking through, um, you know, that, that piece of our work of, um, you know, sharing this process, soliciting input, and uh, you know, toward toward formulating the uh, the, the report and the recommendation areas. So um, I, I think it still goes towards that. And and you know, and, and again, for for that matter, I I don't know that eligibility criterion is an entire session to to hear from the community on. I think that is has been it been endemic in our work throughout. I think if we need to go ahead and amongst ourselves, um, you know, establish a, a, a particular, you know, vote a certain position on it. And then from there, you know, we can find ways to, to channel that and to see if there are, you know, specific inputs about, about the, the question of eligibility. But, you know, uh, just to recap, my view is eligibility is going to depend on the nature of the specific recommendation. And uh, secondly, as we see in Providence, Rhode Island, it has to do with the funding source and the question of whether we get state approval for home rule to, to be able to make disbursements um, on an injury, an injury specific basis in terms of black reparations as a public purpose. If we don't get that, if that is hung up, then there will be no no distributions, um, you know, on on a on on an injury basis, um, uh, or or you know, it will stand a significant legal challenge. But also, in the case of Providence, as I read it, it has to do with the color of money. The money in that case being designated was straight out of ARPA funds, federal government funds, and and so their, their, their determination was that it had to be made available to, to any and all uh, people in, in Providence and Rhode Island, not, not specific to any relation, not barring anyone from at least requesting, uh, uh, you know, some type of benefit from the reparations, whatever reparations program they come to offer. So I, I think these are complex and complicated questions but I don't think we need to have a hearing on them per se, uh, uh, except or unless until we actually have a, a position we've thought through, we've, we've wordsmithed and we've put forward and then people are able to, to respond directly to that before our final, our final report in that area or recommendation in area in that goes out. I just don't think there's, there's not much point to just having a, a general session on that, that question alone. Uh, and, and, and particularly without us having a going, going ahead and taking a ratified uh, written out position on it that people could react to. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Okay, so um, it sounds like we, are, are wanting to think through strategy for the next several months in terms of our listening sessions and whether we'll have enough listening sessions to cover each of these injury areas and maybe wanting to think through what our future listening sessions will look like at another meeting. Um, so is, is everyone okay though with having a general overview of the injury areas at the upcoming listening session, or would folks prefer to focus in on one? And if so, which one would we want to focus on? Yes, Dr. Rhodes. 
you know, you know, I believe having all the injury areas open for discussion would serve us well. I, uh, I do uh, agree with Dr. Chavez in terms of having uh, in relationship uh, to eligibility uh, that 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 would should await our determination uh, and that that determination then be one that is a draft determination and then put out for general discussion uh, among the population. I also think that um, it um, uh, there are there's the whole uh, idea of the survey and the results of that, that also could uh, impact uh, what we are doing and where we're going and et cetera. So I, I think those things need to be held in our head for consideration. Absolutely. Okay, that sounds like a great plan. Alexis? Um. Forgive me if I sound like I'm out of the loop. Um, so I guess when it comes to our, our subsequent meetings, do we know what the other meetings, like if they weren't about, because I, I, I think that it's a good idea. I agree with Dr. Rhodes um, in that like the, the attendees, whoever we're listening to can kind of like guide the conversation based on the criteria or like the framework that we're giving them or like the the um the areas of harm i think that that's great um but i guess then right like if if we're not talking about cuz i agree with dr shabazz i don't think that we need a whole one about eligibility especially since i've been like sort of listening to discussions that have been happening in california with their reparations and the biggest like piece of contention that i've even seen about eligibility has been about like folks with enslaved ancestry and the folks with that. Um, and like, that's been like the biggest piece. And I, I haven't even really heard that conversation happening over here. Um, so if, if it's not, if the meetings are not about specific areas, or maybe it's about one that like, you know, didn't get touched or whatever, like, is, is there other pieces that we like have to get to before we give that recommendation that we haven't discussed yet? Great question. Um, Dr. Rhodes, do you want to address that question or do you, was this a new thought? Yeah, I, think, I, I, yeah, just, I, I think that we need to refer back to the charge itself from the council. And there are like four, you know, four or five things in there that are specific that they're going to be looking for uh, in our report. One of them is eligibility. Uh, they specifically mentioned that. And uh, given that they did mention that, we need to keep that uh, front and center in terms of, of uh, how we uh, answer that question. Uh, and I think that um, uh, if we uh, use these listening sessions to gain that kind of information, in addition to the survey, uh, in addition to other methods of, of getting, getting feedback and and then responding back out. I think that's our roadmap uh, should be uh, from this point on, not only the, is gathering the information that uh, from the public in terms of their input that will allow us to address those areas that uh, are gonna be a part of our final report. Uh, and we need uh, to have those areas covered uh, through uh, public dialogue A and then B through our, through our own deliberations. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Alexis? Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, this, <laughs> this right, we've got to go back to the, to the roots, um, which is extremely helpful. Thank you for pulling this up. Um, so I, I see that like, you know, we've, we've been developing the funding streams and I guess we, we have one, um, which is kind of honestly, like sort of like a, like a soft funding stream, it feels like, because it's nothing about it is sort of like definite, right? Um, it doesn't say in any way that money is definitely going in every year or every cycle to this fund. Um, and being that the other piece is eligibility, which um, is 
I agree is very important. The other piece I think that like we haven't gotten to yet because we're still talking about the areas of harm is the repair piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this might be the most maybe disagreed upon area amongst people because so many people feel like it's it's different things, right? Um, so I almost feel like the repair piece is going to take is, is going to be the biggest piece um, if, if we are choosing to, you know, have listening sessions for this um, because repair looks so different for so many other people. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if anybody has ideas about that. Thank you, Alexis. <clears throat> Yes, Yvonne. Um, so I agree with Irv. Maybe I would like to see us cover all of the um, areas. Um, and to um, Alexis's comment about harm. Um, how Again, I think it, this go, a lot of this goes back to how many of these we're going to have. This is clearly a listening session. And so I'm also feeling like it would be great once we have folks in the room, like you said before, Michelle, to kind of gauge who's in the room and how they can contribute to any one particular topic, but to keep all the topics fresh in the room. Because I think other folks might uh, identify with the, you know, like with the wealth and progress or with the, with the health one. I think everyone has their own um, area where they've had, um, especially people of color where they've had personal things happen and it's usually more than one area and that's the area that they're keenly um, in tune with, you know? So um, I do agree. I think that it would be great to present them all. I, I'm not sure that we need to present each one separately. I think that takes a lot of time. I think mm -hmm. the overview is what we want to focus on and then just dive into conversation and see where the conversation goes. Um, Yes, a moderator is really great to have. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I don't know. You said last time there wasn't one, right? Well, we, so we're running it like a meeting of, it's being posted like a meeting. So I opened the meeting um, as I would open any meeting. And then we went and each member said something brief. But what we didn't do was offer any particular framework for folks to consider. Yeah. So yeah. we just yeah. sort of said, we're here to listen, where this time we're going to offer these injury areas so that folks have something that they can sort of connect to potentially and be able to speak to. Yeah, I think I definitely um, agree that we should just cover them all. Because we'll have this opportunity, actually, we'll find out from talking to people which ones are at the top of their list. You know, they're all important, but there's going to be, I'm sure there's going to be two or three that rise to the top of the list. And maybe we end up talking about those longer anyway. So yeah. instead of dictating what we talk about, let's just see. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Dr. Rhodes? Uh, just, I just wanted to make sure that we... Uh look at number two in terms of an, allocate, an allocation plan uh, that uh, we need to keep that front and center in our mind because that is something that's going to be critical, a critical part of our report. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take this down and I see we have uh, a lot of hands in the audience today. So I'm going to call for public comment. Yvonne, is your hand still up? Sorry. Oh, no I worries. Got I got it. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna read the public comment statement. Um, let's see here. During the public comment period, I will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your full name, pronouns, and address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, we will not 
necessarily be engaging in a conversation with public comment speakers, but we will be listening very carefully. Sometimes if there's a specific question that comes up, we can uh, respond to that, but generally we'll be listening and taking notes. Um, so if you would like to make public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand using the raise hand function. And I will, uh, Jennifer will move you into the room in the order that your hand has been raised. And then um, we will move on from there. Jennifer, are you, I saw that your camera's off. Are you still there? Oh, you're on it. <laughs> okay. Welcome to our first um, public commenter. And if you are able to unmute, you can go ahead. We are not hearing you right now if you're speaking. So I see you listed as Prime Friedman and um, we cannot hear you. Does anyone else hear Prime Friedman? Okay. Okay, Prime, we will come back to you um, so you can work out whatever audio, um, you may be having an audio issue, but we will not, we will definitely come back to you. So Jennifer, if you want to bring in the next, that would be great. And welcome, yep. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Jalen. I am um, a Boston resident, Massachusetts resident. Um, I just want to make clear that I am a person that worked with the NDC and Antonio Edwards, and we just actually created the Boston Task Force for reparations. And it's actually, and you can go read articles about us. I am the youth. So I've been out here doing this work. And I also want to make clear that HR 40 is not reparations because it's not lineage based. And I can tell you this from right now because I saw you, Michelle, pull up the tweet from Narcan and Cobra and um, us Black Americans who are the U.S. descendants of American child house slavery. We're talking about the 40 million emancipated slaves of 1865. Um, this needs to be lineage based and you guys need to get the census on how many um, U.S. descendants of American child house slavery, and the only reason why I have to be specific is because we are different from Black immigrants, such as Haitians, Trinidadians, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans. We are a different ethnic group of people, so when people are calling us people of color, Black and brown, um, and BIPOC, that is um, highly disrespectful because we are our own individual ethnic group. We need to be acknowledged. And I do think that this needs to be lineage based because um, you would be giving away um, our money to immigrants who came over here willingly. We came over here forcefully because we were sold by our own people. So I just want that to make clear that HR 40, and we also have been having problems in other states too, getting their task force going because of Nargan and Cobra are going behind our backs, they're being sneaky, um, and they're undermining us, and they're trying to push their agenda for Pan-Africanism for immigrants to have their reparations here when they need to get their reparations from who enslaved them. For example, Africa has the African Union, Caribbean has CARICOM. They need to go ask them for reparations. I've been out here doing this work with the grassroots and with the elders. And I thought this is very important to express that HR 40 is not reparations. We have worked with Chris from um, CJEC and California Task Force Reparations. And you guys can clearly see by reading it, it is lineage based. Um, and we have been here since 1865 and prior to that, even older. So um, I'm asking you guys to review the format and make it lineage based and actually see in the area 
who's actually a U.S. descendant of chattel slavery, not descendant of a slave, because when you say descendant of a slave, you're allowing any other ethnic group to come here and receive reparations from the U.S. Um, United States government when that belongs to us. Um, Boston and uh, Massachusetts, we have been here. There are Black people everywhere, and they deserve reparations. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know four immigrants that go to UMass Amherst, and there's nothing but white supremacy on that campus. Um, and that's another thing. And I also want to be clear that you guys need to co um, collect the right um, information from the census and actually seeing what um, residents are U.S. descendants of chattel slavery, um, because if you give this money away to the immigrants, that is allowing them to come onto our um, soil and get money that is owed to us because we have a debt owed, and that is now, and it's not later, and I just wanted to land my plane, and if you also want to send me your email, I can, you know, we can have conversations, I can get you connected with, I can show you some of the work I have done uh, we have articles written about us, how we got the Boston Task Force for reparations just passed in the city. I'm also on Twitter, so I just wanted to win my plane on that. And if you guys can send me your contact information, we can also have some discussions for sure. Thank you, Jalen. And I will, um, once public comment is completed, I'm going to pull up our contact page so that you can send us an email and then that will give us the ability to be in contact. And of course, you're welcome to come to any of our meetings and um, speak in public comment at any time. So thank you very much for being here. For having me, thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So um, we are bringing in our next public commenter. And you are free to go. Can I be heard clearly? Yes. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say good afternoon, AHRA, and I want to thank you so much for um, prioritizing the recommendations of UMass ACE to put place it onto your agenda th uh, this afternoon. Um, again, I just want to say um, we look forward to uh, future engagement with your process. And just on behalf of American descendants of chattel slavery, we do want to um, affirm that we um, are an ethnic group. We are a distinct people. We have a peoplehood, and we want to to be recognized uh, within our our country. So uh, again, I look forward to your to your commentary on uh, the recommendations provided and um, further engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, we have three or four more hands up. Welcome. Antonia, we can't hear you right now. Sorry, are you, it's Antonia Edwards, how are you? Okay, now we can hear you, great. Okay, great. good, thank you so much for allowing me into your space today. I was invited by Kiera who is an alumni from UMass Amherst. Um, my name is Antonia Edwards. I live in the Boston area. I do national reparations with the California Task Force, NASD, and also CJEC. I also work with the U.S. Freedman Project out of New York and also the Chicago Freedman Project. We have a grassroots network of organizations that basically functions to um, represent our people on the national level um, for reparations. And we're striking down HR 40 because first of all, we've been eliminated from sitting at the table to speak on our behalf. There's been a concerted effort across the nation to go into municipalities to um, strike up these reparation things, and it's clearly co um, really cooperative. I mean, so basically, reparations never belongs at the municipal level, the local level, because they can never pay for the 40 mil 4 million emancipated slaves. Um, we know that that debt so far is $16 trillion. And so this concerted effort to do this is a distraction, and it also creates a, a division between us and the people who oppressed us. And so I want to come and say, this reparations word is being overexploited. Um, when you're on a municipal level, it should be atonement. It should be restitution for restorative justice. So when you keep using reparations over and over and over again, it gets watered down. I personally want to ask you, um, because I do know ex-students my age, they went to UMass Amherst. I used to hang there, by the way. Can you please change the verbiage, number one, to say atonement? because it's not reparations. Reparations is only due to the 40, 40 million emancipated slaves 
for chattel slavery in the U.S. We cannot get bogged down with the transatlantic slave trade and other people that were enslaved in their countries. They have a direct claim to United Kingdom, to Spain, Portugal, Maine, whatever, not to the U.S. And we also want to be recognized as the U.S. freedmen. We are a legal standing um, body of people that's um, been registered by the U.S. government through the, U the American Freedmen Act, the American Freedmen Bureau, and also the American Freedmen Bank. When you say black slaves or African slaves, that's including everybody in the diaspora. The United States shouldn't be paying for that. However, I have many friends from all over the country. They should be compensated for the wrong um, systematic oppression and racism that they received since 1865 with the Immigration Act. Prior to that, there was only 1% Black immigrants in the country. So when people talk about reparations, they are erasing our culture, which is highly disrespectful, very egregious, and they want to start from the time that they get here and talk about the harms that they receive. And no other race of people had to have suffered any harms in America, whether it be the Native Americans, the AAPI community, or even the Jewish people who have um, suffered the Holocaust have ever allowed anybody else to dictate their narrative. So we find it very egregious, we find it very painful, and it's very disrespectful for other people to use you and your establishment, like others, to, for their narrative. And so we're asking, can you please change your, your movement to atonement? And then number two, you have this as being the African heritage reparations. A lot of people who are a foundational black to this country who descend from chattel slavery don't even call ourselves African. So we're known as American freedmen. So if you really want to bridge the gap and you want to heal the community, please talk to us. Sit and talk to us. I'm saying we're very available. We're very quite capable. We have highly intelligent people. We have scholars who are willing to speak to you about that. But when an institution follows somebody who has a uh, an agenda, obviously, to make sure that they're satisfied on their end and not talk to the people that harm, we could never go to anybody else's country and say, "Oh, I'm living," you're saying, in dire need, a dire or uh, uninhabitable conditions. I want to sue the government because I shouldn't have to live this way. And so that's what's basically being done here. And I wanna say I'm not divisive. I have family members that are from the islands. I, I do masks, I do carnival, my mother builds costumes. We've been everywhere. It's just very disrespectful and egregious to come to America and overstep us and overstep the boundaries and act like we don't exist and don't allow us to speak. So those are the two things I'm gonna ask you for. Atonement for your movement, take out the reparations, and also please change this to American freedmen. Um, um, reparations, because you're you're talking about the reparations that due to people from chattel slavery in America that other people have suffered racism from. But had it not been for slavery that my ancestors suffered, they wouldn't have had these harms. So those are the things I'm going to recommend and ask you to do. It's very egregious, and no other race or people that are harmed would allow that to happen. Thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Not right now, but thank you very much. Um, and um, also, as I said, I'll, I'll put up our email address at the end of public thank comment. You. Thank you. Can I just make one more statement? So we were able to get to talk to Mayor Wu and also the city council. They too had black enslaved and African um, enslaved in their verbiage. And I, I was personally able to get them to change it. So the new bill that comes out will read that the, the body of people that sit on this task force which is a five will be primarily those who descend from chattel slavery and American freedmen is in there. So we're asking everybody else to mirror that. And mm -hmm. if you don't mirror it, then it just seems like we're not gonna get this done smoothly across Massachusetts. And so um, you can look at the, um, the, the basically the recording from that day is dated the 14th um, C Hall. Um, it is um, Mr. Aurora who announced that. They did amend it and they did amend it based on the recommendations. We had a petition, over 500 people signed it. And we just asked to be recognized and respected as a people. We mean no harm, we're not aggressive, we're not angry. We, we're just really disappointed that people are co-opting our reparations and erasing us. And it's pure erasure. So I thank you. If anything I can do for you, let me know. Um, Kier is your alumni, I will go through her. She's well-versed. Um, and we just wanna elevate her and support her and um, her mission to work with you, okay? Thank you, thank you for allowing me to speak, it means a lot. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jonathan, I think you're in. Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak in this space. Um, my name is Jonathan Bryant. Um, you just spoke to my partner, Antonia Edwards. 
co-founder of uh, Solidarity. We also are uh, in with the U.S. Freedman Project. And um, I'm not going to be long because she pretty much said on what I wanted to say. And I, I believe that who it goes to specificality is very important. You know, we, we have to go at the beginning of where the harm was directed to, and that was the American freedmen. And that was the status that was given to us after the emancipation. You know, so we, we, we cannot allow with the flat blackness thing to go on and, 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 and it go to everybody. And um, it, it's wrong and, and it's, agree, it's egregious. And um, please listen to the community and listen to the people and, and, and what's going on. And, um, um, you know, keep American Freeman in your mind. And I, I'll, I'll land my plane with that because, uh, like I said, my uh, sister Antonia, my, my partner, she, she basically said it all. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, and it looks like we have uh, at least two, if not three more. Okay. Hello? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Laura Mills. Good afternoon. I um, had a few comments. I think that Amherst again has made things complicated, um, overcomplicated. Um, I, I think uh, the past comments and shout out to Boston where I was raised and where I'm from. Um, thank you to the the uh, speakers who who just spoke and and stated their um, position so strongly. But um, Amherst is a unique place, and I don't think there is a a lot of um, people who would consider themselves uh, black freedmen or African American. And um, I just wanted to say as well that I think that we are arguing about eligibility before anything has even been allocated, which kind of just sidesteps and postpones any allocation. I feel like we need to stop fighting over it that hasn't even been put into place. And um, the last thing I'll just say is, you know, from everyone has, you know, a different I way that they experience and identify as being Black, if they consider themselves Black people. And um, from just my thinking, you know, Africans came over here and were enslaved, they were Africans. Then they became all, you know, uh, from their experience, their American experience, a new people. But I don't think, you know, a, a severe and violent and um, the experience of slavery can only hold a people together. I think we are, we, we have different identities and that is just one part of an identity as a black person who was born in America. So I would just hope, you know, you know, the Amherst Reparations Assembly or the African Heritage Reparations Assembly would not, you know, so much harp on uh, or try to identify, you know, a black identity, but because I, I think that's going to just be very difficult to do. So I, I just wanted to share those those thoughts. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> hey. My chat. We can hear you. Peace, peace. My name is Cash Gaines. I'm Black American um, on both sides for context of the conversation. Um, I wanted to say that um, similar to the previous speakers, I agree that um, calling things reparations that aren't necessarily for unpaid wages for um, our ancestors' labor 
um, is kind of a mischaracterization. State acts of atonement is more, uh, or city acts of atonement or university acts of atonement, uh, I think is uh, more feasible in that instance or, or more applicable. Um, although still valiant, um, the federal claim is the real win for reparations. And uh, it's crazy numbers that I can speak to further um, once I see the emails and the contact page. But um, I wanted to just mention uh, quickly the Oregon bill, uh, although a statewide uh, act of atonement, this bill, Senate Bill 619, suggests lifetime payments of $123,000 a year. And it already has a clause in it uh, um, that speaks to eligibility. One would need to trace if their ancestor was enslaved in America back to a census of 1850, 1860, 1870, which is around the end of the Civil War. As well, they would need to have been claiming Black uh, for the last 10 years on federal documents uh, to weed out people who maybe uh, don't identify as Black American anymore. Uh, we, uh, we support that uh, eligibility criterion, and it was created by economist Dr. William Darity, um, or championed by him anyway. Um, I've spoken to the uh, Lady Julia Mieja, who I believe is the mayor of Boston, because there's a Boston Reparations uh, Commission coming soon. Um, and I told her that win-win strategies are gonna need to be uh, a part of the conversation uh, so that we have public and private partnerships um, and, and uh, that we'll need to also convince conservatives, obviously. But it is obviously more conservative to pay just black Americans, in fact, a reinvestment uh, than to pay all modern day Americans with the suggested things like universal basic income or um, I guess speaking to immigration in general. So uh, all that being said, I just wanted to mention that there are numbers being suggested and that land is also a part of the conversation. And thank you guys for mentioning reparations uh, in any form or fashion. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I think we have one more. We're coming back to Prime Friedman and Prime. Uh, uh, we can barely hear you. I do hear some audio, but try again. Hello, hello, please, please. This is Prime Yes, go ahead and try to make your comment. I'll let you know if we can't hear you. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I'm always going to be very impressive. Pardon me, I, I have lost my voice probably because I'm always yelling at you. Anyway, uh, I am a proud American freedman and a reparationist. I'm from New York City. Um, I appreciate all of the people who have come before me and spoke on this topic because this is a very much needed discussion and I appreciate y'all for allowing us to speak because we're talking about the community here. So when um, we're talking about eligibility, as touched on it flawlessly, American freedmen, how are you an American freedman? You have to show and prove that you have an ancestor or ancestors who were enslaved from 1776 to 1865. That's the lineage standard. Also, you have to show and prove that you self-identify as Black, African-American, colored, Negro, uh, American freedmen, things of that nature. So there's a lineage standard and there is a self-identification standard. And that can be shown and proven on a lot of our uh, job applications, uh, birth certificates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I agree. Uh, it should not be called uh, reparations because reparations is only done on a national level. And the standard for reparations must be done by eliminating, eliminating, eliminating the wealth grand canyon for the American freeman population and European Americans and Asian Americans and all other groups of people, we have been historically targeted and uh, put at the bottom due to the stain and the legacy of slavery, due to the destruction of the reconstruction era, due to black code and uh, discrimination. Uh, we were excluded from the GI Bill, all of those things. So I would suggest that you don't call it a uh, uh, reparation. I do have some uh, suggestions as far as uh, not calling it reparations. I call it state acts of atonement. You can call it economic security initiatives. You can call it state equity initiatives, uh, justice initiatives and policies, but you cannot and you will not or you should not call it uh, reparations for the American freedmen. 
um, again, the standard for reparation is eliminating, eliminating the wealth gap for the American freedmen. We have been targeted historically, and we need that equity, not just equality, but equity. We need to be prioritized because it was our ancestors who did not come here by choice. There's a difference between those who came by choice and those who came in chains. My ancestors came in here in chains. And because they came in chains, all people who are in this country came over here to benefit off of the chains that we came in but, but by my ancestors. They call it the American dream. And that American dream was based off of the American freedom nightmare. So we have to be specific. HR 40 is not reparation. I repeat, HR 40 is not reparation. What is reparations? Reparations by law. By law is monetary com compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, um, guarantees of non reoccurring crimes and harms, and also satisfaction and closure. So that is the standard. That is what we define as reparations. In the Freedman community, we do not accept reparations unless it eliminates the wealth gap, unless it includes, but not limited to, direct cash payments. We live in a white supremacist capitalistic society. So it is only right that because since our land and our wealth was stolen, we get some capital. We need capital to empower ourselves, to uh, exercise self-determination, just like other groups of people in this country need to do. So um, that being said, uh, I thank you. Thank you for your time. I would really appreciate it if we have more public discussions like this and, and you allow the community to speak because if you're advocating for the community and you're not doing any community outreach, then you're really not representing the community, especially. So um, I appreciate this. Thank you. Have a blessed day and I hope you heard me. Peace. Thank you very much, Prime. And yes, we heard, we could hear your full comment. Um, so we have one more uh, comment, and then um, I will put up that contact information. Welcome, Ernest. Yep, greetings, uh, I guess, task force for commission members. Um, I just wanted to echo some of the sentiments that we heard from, you know, various freemen or Black Americans across the United States who are actual descendants of uh, U.S. chattel slavery. One, yes, we value the lineage standard and believe that's important for all reparative uh, solutions offered for the, the, you know, the um, traumas of chattel slavery, as well as Jim Crow and other state sanctioned oppression that occurred afterwards. Um, two, I wanted to say, you know, I'm just reading some articles here and it looks like, you know, from a municipality standpoint, you guys are seeking to achieve what was achieved in Evanston. And I would state that, you know, what you're hearing from the descendant community is that, uh, you know, municipality reparations, which as it's as it being called, isn't truly considered reparations in our in our uh, sense of the definition. But we want, I guess, with that being said, um, you know, even though municipality reparations is being you know called like a municipality state at uh, municipality atonements or state atonements, I think it's important that you guys recognize the power that you do have. So since you're operating on behalf of the municipality of Amherst, I would recommend that you guys seek to work with the Boston task force as well in actually crafting, legis not even crafting legislation, but crafting a proposal that seeks for the state of Massachusetts to create a state commission. And the idea behind that is, of course, there's greater resources and allocations that can be uh, dished out from a state level than simply from a municipality level. Then at the second, uh, I guess one of the other things I wanted to mention is that when we talk about reparations and we talk about the conditions of those who are descendants of slaves, I would refer you guys to the Boston uh, Color of Wealth Report, which did some disaggregation when you look at the data of uh, black wealth in the state of, Bo uh, I guess not in the state, but in the city of Boston. And I would, I would make the argument that if you were to pursue you know, a color of wealth report for the city of Amherst that you would find similar disparities where US blacks, AKA freedmen have a wealth next to zero. Well, that isn't necessarily the same 
picture or definition for those who are not freedmen. At the same time, when we talk about atonement or addressing a gap or providing actual repair to black Americans who descend from chattel slavery or this ultimate sin of our country, we need to keep in mind that when we use the word repair, it should address the community that we are talking about. It shouldn't be something similar to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where it's new, very neutral based and it's, a, I guess, race neutral in its approach. And then at the same time, when we're thinking about cities like Evanston, uh, me being from Michigan, you know, we're watching closely what's going to happen in Detroit because it's it's been stated that a similar model would be uh, pursued. Now, our issue with this is that when we think of a municipality or a city a city uh, level reparations program, we understand that based on Evanston, only 16 families have received the quote unquote reparations or repair that was offered in the form of a housing voucher. Now, as you guys move through with the Amherst you know, reparations program, again, I would just ask you to consider what has happened, consider the comments of the community, and at the same time, use the power that you currently have to advocate for things that may appease the community in terms of satisfaction, oh, uh, which, which could include things of, uh, like I said, the motion for a statewide commission or the motion for delineation of black data so that we are able to see the economic, the true socioeconomic disparities that are plaguing black Americans who reside in Amherst. And then from there, if this reparations fund is to stay open for the next 10 years, I would suggest that you guys make ongoing recommendations to truly tackle those socioeconomic conditions that are being suffered by the descendant community. Uh, with that, I am complete. Thank you very much, Ernest, for your comment. And um, I will mention to members that the Alliance for Afro-American Cultural Education from the University of Massachusetts, this is the AACE information that you all received in your email and is in the packet, um, includes the color of wealth report that uh, our last speaker referred to. Um, I'm also going to share my screen and give folks um, some information here. So this, these are the two email addresses um, for folks who would like to reach us. If you send an email to these two addresses or one or the other, um, if you're going to send to one or the other, please send to Jennifer Moyston. Jennifer's here with us. She is our staff liaison. She will make sure that all members receive your comments. She just turned her camera on. Jennifer, would you just wave? <laughs> Thanks. Um, and you can you can send to Jennifer or to both of us, and we will make sure that all members of the committee receive your comments, your written comments. Um, I also wanted to just once again share for folks that the AHRA is having an upcoming listening session on January 11th. This is our Engage Amherst page. Um, if you look at the URL at the top, engageamherst.org backslash AHRA. This is where you can find um, a lot of information about our work. Um, and in particular, this uh, listening session will be happening on J January 11th. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. Public comment is completed for today, um, but please uh, do feel free to join us at future meetings. And I'm taking a look at the time. I would like to do a quick time track for members here. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Yvonne. What is your timing look like today? I can stay until about 3.30. Okay, excellent. And Alexis? Same. Great. Uh, Dr. Shabazz? Same. Okay. Dr. Rhodes? The same. Okay. And Hala? Uh, while we're waiting on Hala, Jennifer, does that work for you if we stay on until 3.30? Oh, yep, that's fine. Okay. Okay. 
So um, that was the most public comment that we've received so far. So that was really, really excellent to have so many folks come out um, and offer um, public comment. So I just want to acknowledge that we haven't had that much public comment and so acknowledge that members may be feeling different reactions or may or may not want to talk um, specifically about the public comment that we received today. Um, so I'm just going to look for any hands um, to guide us in terms of that for the remaining of our time. If somebody feels that they would like to respond now, please raise your hand. Otherwise, um, what I would like to suggest is that we allow our ourselves time to process that and digest that information and then carry it on into our next meeting when we'll be talking about um, the majority of the comments were about eligibility. But I'm looking for hands now. Yes, Yvonne. Um, I'd like I'd like to say that, yeah, that was really very lively and informative. Um, I feel like, um, and some of the folks in the room with me might disagree. Um, I do see the distinction between reparations and atonement. I feel also that um, on the municipal level, there's a different way to deal with reparations and atonement that's specific to each community. And so some of the assumptions about the Amherst community, um, you know, the way that we need to address it is for it to work in our community. Um, so um, I do see that maybe we want to have a conversation later on about what that means for us in this distinct community. Because um, certainly um, I think that the conversations that we've been having more than anything has been about um, justice and um, in our community, looking at and amassing the stories of folks who have lived here. And the idea that, you know, for, uh, reparations actually is a construct of, um, of white people. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I mean, reparations, that whole idea of reparations, and everyone is reacting to that. And as we know, lots of times these constructs that are created by white people are about making divisions. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be a new definition and a new way to walk through this idea of reparations, even if it is about redefining, you know, and even if it is, I do believe it's not one or the other. I think reparations is a federal level. That is the federal level. The lazy thing was to push it down onto municipalities. And I do feel like municipalities have a responsibility as far as reparations, even if it's renamed atonement. Um, I do feel that that is a responsibility of a town like Amherst. So, I mean, I'm just saying that we need to look at what our community is and what we can do within our community with the funds and the monies that are available to us. And then on a larger scale, partnering with the folks in Boston about what the state in general wants to do and then how we can lobby the federal government to take their responsibility because that's where the responsibility lies. Thanks, Yvonne. Alexis? Yeah, I just, I I wanted to thank everybody for coming out. This is, uh, and, and this is why I brought it up earlier is because we really like, especially in this community, haven't really heard very strong um, a, a, a push for specifically um, um, folks with um, who, who are descendants of victims of chattel slavery. Um, and I, I feel like, um, and, and I, I, I agree with um, Ms. Mendez about, um, you know, we are kind of in a in a, in a certain town that has like some very specific um, historical um, dues, debts, maybe I'll call it. Um, so, and that's not to say that we're we're unique at all. Um, so, I want to thank everybody for coming out and and making public comment. And I'm also very excited about the prospect of collaborating. 
um, and working with folks across the state to be able to work on this larger movement. So, so thank you everyone for taking the time um, and joining us today. Thanks, Alexis. Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it's always good conversation. Um, I just would reiterate that, you know, the, the word, the concept of reparations is as old as human conflict itself. It's, you know, simply when a harm has been done to a group of people by a government, by another uh, uh, force, outside force, and once that is that that original harm, that injustice, you know, you're trying to overcome, overcome it. You're, you've you've reached an agreement. This was wrong. You've apologized. The 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 harming group has apologized. They recognize they did wrong, and then you then say, how do we fix this? How do we repair? That's as old as human uh, conflict in human history. So it's it's not invented by you know the the uh, United Nations. It wasn't invented by the League of Nations. It wasn't invented you know in by by any you know super governmental or or white people or anything. It's as old as human conflict in our in our story. Okay, and so I don't back off from the word, and I'm not going to shift a la Sandy Darity or a la anybody else to say, let's call it atonement or let's call it restorative or something. No, it is reparations. And it is reparations on a local municipal level to address harms that were historically uh, 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 occurred and uh, the continuation of those harms are still in, in evident. And it's to say that we're stopping that. Again, our original resolution of the town of Amherst that gave birth to the African Heritage Reparations Assembly was a resolution uh, calling for the need to end, calling to end structural racism. It wasn't a call to repay the uh, descendants of, of slavery, of slaves, of enslaved people who reside here in Amherst because as has been pointed out, that cannot be done. There is not enough money in Amherst to pay for all of the people who are here, who are descendants of, of, of uh, whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. There is not enough money collected in Amherst to pay all of us who are here, who are descendants of ancestors who were enslaved. And that's not what the original resolution was about. The original resolution was to say there are systematic structural racism in this town. They have a, a, a legacy that still affects us today, that the things like the restrictive covenants and the deed restrictions to try to keep Black people out and from being able to have, have a home here in Amherst, people like uh, the first Black a full-time professor at UMass who still this to this day does not live in Amherst. He lives in South Hadley, but was discriminated against when he got here in the 1940s that he was not able to get a home here. This is what we're trying to rectify. This is what we're trying to correct. This is what we're trying to repair within the limitations we face in terms of state of city gov city government city funds and 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 city resources but we but we're, we're we're charged with writing a report that does the best we can within our limitations for that effort and so for me the ending of structural racism is a problem that is not just against those who descend and i do i have my genealogy i have my lineage I know exactly where I come from, okay? And my people who were enslaved in what is today called Louisiana, okay? So I know my, my own roots and I know where I stand. I'm as foundational as any foundational black American can claim to be. 
So I know where I stand, but I'm trying to deal with the problem of structural racism based upon the resolution that reparations for Amherst, you know, gave rise to and brought forward and that we all responded to and got the, you know, signed petitions and everything else and got the town council to unanimously ratify. And that is the basis of our charge. So yes, we will talk about eligibility. We will talk about, we have already mentioned the concept of lineage. I think it is an important one. It's an important one for us to all be educated about. It's an important one for actually, my call is governments, local, state, and federal immediately ought to give African-Americans the genealogical and DNA resources to get their genealogy done. It, you know, when people say, oh, it, it's in the census, it's not in the census. It's not in the 2020 census that we can go and count who here in Amherst were or are descendants of an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. I wish it was that simple. It is not in the 1850 census. It is not in the 1860. Most of the 1860 census is lost to us. We don't even have it, you know, at the, at the, at the municipal, at the local levels. These were lost. So I wish it was that simple to just say we can go here, push a button, and we're good, and, and everybody, every black person in Amherst can 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 find and know just with a push of a button, you know, who their, you know, have the federal record that they of who they descend from that was enslaved. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. We need help. We need resources that that should actually be done. And then we can have, you know, a lineage, uh, 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 you know, access to a lineage approach once that is done. But just right now talking about it, that's, that's, that's easy, more easy said than done. I've read, read the Color of Wealth report, you know, and that goes into statistics in Boston about Haitians who are 50% of the Caribbean community, Caribbean uh, uh, immigrant community uh, in, in Boston. Uh, it talks about Cape Verdeans. It talks about all these other groups that we have right here in Amherst too. But you know, it, it and 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 it also can can look at. We can try to drill down, but it's going to take some work before we can really drill down and disaggregate those who are actual descendants of of ancestors who were enslaved. Uh, prior to June and readily accessible. But even once it is accessible, I still think we need to have a, a, a more open-ended approach that can talk about specific kinds of benefits and specific things that we can do in Amherst to help those who are descendants of those in the United States who were enslaved, but as well also look at benefits and responses uh, to problems affecting uh, all, all black people, all uh, uh, black African American people, regardless of, of, of if they came over here uh, after 1865. Uh, I think we ought to have an open ended, broad approach looking at ways to respond to the problem of racism uh, uh, and structural racism in Amherst. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. Yvonne, I see that your hand, is that still up from before? Okay. <laughs> um, so it's just about four minutes to 3.30. So I wanted to quickly check in to see if there are any other comments right now. We will, of course, continue this discussion. Um, I don't believe, and just for folks who are watching and for folks who may see this on the recording, our, we're going to take a two week break. So our next meeting will be on Monday, January 2nd at 2 p.m. Um, and we will, I am sure at that time be continuing this discussion. We will also hold the recommendations from the AACE. I think we've talked um, a bit about that today in the context of our public comment and um, 
in this conversation, but it is really too important with a couple minutes left for us to try to delve into that right now. So if um, it's okay with you all, I'd like to give you a brief update from the Donahue Institute about the survey work, um, just to kind of switch gears. I see that Jennifer's hand is raised though. Sorry about that, Jennifer. Yeah, no problem. The second is a holiday. You're right. And the ninth would be just a couple days before our listening session. Um, would folks be able to meet on the third, fourth, or fifth? You want me to send a doodle poll? Would that work best? All right, well, let's yeah. a doodle poll. Yeah. Okay. Or I'll just send a, a preferred time that you can come up with. Okay, I'll do that when we when we um, when we're finished, Jennifer, and I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, all right. So I wanted to briefly give you an update on the survey. I had the opportunity to meet with. Uh, Kerry at the Dunahue Institute. I think I gave maybe a brief update at last week's meeting. Dr. Rhodes, you weren't at last week's meeting. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, you are. I okay. All right. So if I'm repeating myself, excuse me, but what we agreed to is Kerry is going to speak with the executive director of the Dunahue Institute to... Let me put my stuff up first. To someone's, um, okay, to um, assess our unique situation and what we're hoping to get out of a survey and see if there's a small scope in which she can work with us to develop really strong survey questions. Um, and that would be uh, with regard to a more informal survey. So this wouldn't be the survey that we've talked about multiple times that was um, representative, um, randomized, um, which is a survey that I know Dr. Rhodes has really advocated for. And I think there are strong reasons for us to pursue. Um, but I think we need to figure out a balance given the time that we have left to do some survey work and then potentially to recommend in our report that a broader survey happens um, that is randomized. Um, and that is representative that then really speaks to potentially, for example, the way that the funds would be used as um, as the time progressed. So um, I'm going to stop there and just see if there are any questions. My hope is that we will be able to get a, a response back from Kerry. She was um, planning to, as I said, speak with her executive director about what might be the best approach for us. And yes, Dr. Rhodes. So uh, briefly, uh, uh, when I look back at the charge that was given us at that number two, uh, which said uh, we were going to consult with the uh, African-American community uh, and get guidance from them, uh, that I would be in favor of, uh, of uh, doing the survey of the African-American community in terms of the information that we already have i.e. in terms of those people who have already responded, they're a part of BAM, they're, they came through the portal and identified themselves, I would, you know, I would suggest, and I'm assuming that uh, Kerry would agree, uh, and all of us, because we would be much more efficient and effective to survey that group. It's obviously not a representative sample. Uh, there are some risks in doing that, and uh, however, that's what we have. We do not have uh, the ability, well, we do have the ability to do it, would be time consuming, of going out and developing a sample from the wider African-American community, which we would have to then go out and identify all of them, or you know, more than 100, that we don't already have. And there's no guarantee that we, we will get above that group that we, we already have. So therefore, if I'm going to weigh in on it and deal with it, I would say, hey, if we're gonna do an informal survey, then let's, let's, let's go with that group, which is African-Americans, which then would satisfy uh, a part of that number two that said we would consult with 
and get approval of whatever we we're going to do with that uh, with that group. At least we can we can satisfy the first part is that we're going to consult with the African American community. Yeah, and I think that's where Carrie was leaning, and she really wanted to speak with Mark um, and just see um, how they might. We want something that has a lot of integrity and we want the questions to have a lot of integrity and we want um, to be able to reach as many of the folks that we have to reach. So uh, as soon as I have something back from her, which I hope will be before our next meeting, um, we'll be able to discuss that more in depth. And it, is, it, is, it, it is really, it is, it is it, no, we're in Amherst, we're in an academic community. So no matter what kind, no matter what kind of survey we come up with, we are going to be subject to criticism. So my, and I will argue for it as strongly, let's go where our strength is, let's go where our numbers are, let's go where the, uh, who we know is there and let's survey that group. Yeah. And she had some good ideas about how, like, even the people that we survey can then send it to other people. So it is, there are ways that we can circulate it even beyond the 150 or 200 folks that we have for sure on a list. Um, so Jennifer, I saw that your hand was raised or is raised. No? Okay. Dr. Shabazz. It is. It, it oh, was. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I just... Um... I think the best thing to say here is that we have a lot of events that are going to be geared to the African community coming up in the next three months. And so um, either give it, sending those cards out with the, the QR code on it and or folks from the AHRA coming and engaging with the community would be good. I just, I you know, I'm not a member of the AHRA, I'm your staff liaison, but I do a lot of community engagement and it just seems to to put a cap on it and say, we're only gonna use these people who filled it out just seems, I don't know. And and not that I'm talking against Dr. Rhodes because one group could do that, but another group could go and do some boots on the ground stuff so that you could get a better, more even group of, of um, responses from community members. Absolutely. And we've talked about that, Jennifer, and getting out there. So we have the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts list. We have the inclusion portal list. Um, and then we have these upcoming opportunities. Um, and Jennifer, we should speak about those opportunities um, and seeing what members of the HRA might be able to be there to engage with members um, of the community. And and oh, also, the first event is on the 26th for Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Yes. And is that virtual, Jennifer? No, that's in person at the bank center from 11 that's, to 3. That's right. Um, okay. So do any members know that they're going to be attending that event? Yes. I see some. Yes. Okay. At least three. So I'm going to get a bunch. I have cards still. I'll get more printed as needed. That gives us an opportunity um, to get word out about the listening session. So the postcard that has that information plus the QR code, I will make sure that I get those to Hala, to Alexis, and to Dr. Shabazz um, prior to that event occurring. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Shabazz? I think you're frozen. Uh, back to yeah. the survey question. Oh, yep. You were frozen in a second, so we missed we missed what you said. Okay. So the other piece of this is, um, again, and and you, um, some of us have been interacting with the college campuses, um, but the question becomes, do we have authorization from the body to, you know, move forward? But UMass has a Black population, a population that identifies itself as Black African American of over 1,500, okay? That's, the students are about 1,464, the staff, the faculty, you're over 1,500, okay? Now, problem is not all of that group 
although affiliated with UMass as employees or as um, students, they don't all live in Amherst, but they are disaggregated. There is a number and there are emails. And if the university would uh, partner with us and approve, it could be possible to get survey instrument out to that population, 1,500, okay? Then there's 100 plus at Amherst College. They know them, they're disaggregated. We know who they are. Again, they don't all necessarily live in Amherst, but a good number of them do. And then there's a small number at Hampshire College, disaggregated, known. So again, it would be a matter of um, if there is agreement in this body to go through town government, to go through uh, uh, Jennifer Moyston and, and the town manager's office, to liaise or, or through the chair, uh, you know, for us to, or someone from this body to liaise with those campuses. And then you could put, potentially put the survey instrument in the hands of approximately 1,700 of the Black African Americans that are defined in the Amherst, uh, um, you know, that a good number of them are, are defined in the Amherst population, maybe not all, but a good number. And, and, and perhaps within the questions of the survey, get, you know, ask if there are any details they might want to share that help us to know whether they live in Amherst or not, and that sort of thing. So we could kind of track the, the survey results that come in based upon those that indicate they are they do live in Amherst, not just attend one of the three institutions. So that's one idea. Secondly, um, the question of um, the, the, the list, is there, do we want to at some point kind of look through all of these different lists, the BAM list where it currently is, the inclusion portal list and any other kinds of lists to begin to, to, to have a, um, a list of those that have identified that um, and, and, you know, and particularly again, where we can, those that are resident of Amherst from that list so that we have, you know, an exact sense if they have emails, if they have ground addresses, what the full number is that we could send for, uh, send the survey to. Because right now it's not like we've just got different names across different lists, but we don't know if, if Dr. Rhodes threw out a, the number, maybe it's a, it comes to a hundred. But um, if we could work to consolidate the mailing list that we have from all of the different lists, that would be good to know what the what the genuine number is. Finally, the and, and of course building on to it with these upcoming events and any other names and, and persons. I sent out some time back just additional names that I found uh, from going through precinct eight uh, voter voter rolls. Uh, I think it was maybe the November voter voter uh, rolls, but whatever date it was. Um, you know, if, if we did all the other precincts and really, you know, um, could kind of double check that maybe some more names could, could result from, from analyzing the, the town's uh, uh, voter, voter list. Because um, there you definitely know they're resident and it's just a matter of if, if names, you know, come off the list that, that, that uh, occur to you um, or, or whomever's checking. So those are just some concrete suggestions relative to to the surveying piece. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Great suggestions. Dr. Rhodes, I, we're going to take one more comment. Yeah, 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 I, mean, I, I, I just, uh, Dr. Shabazz, I, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of the 1500, but the only caution I would like for us to realize is that uh, we are uh, doing reparations in relationship to Amherst. The hand that feeds us is the Amherst Council and, and the residents of Amherst. If we're gonna do a survey 
we need to ensure that when we do that survey and we put out we put out results, those results need to be from people who we have positively identified as being African American from Amherst who live in Amherst. Those so yes, sending out to the fifteen hundred, but you have to have a box in there that says, "Are you an Amherst resident?" If you do that, then that's fine. I'm fine with it, and I have to go. Yes, um, let me just make, before you go, Doc, Dr. Rhodes, just very quick statement. Um, Dr. Carly Tartikov uh, was in touch with me about a week and a half ago. She is a member of, a, I think a longtime board member of the Amherst Neighbors Organization. She is now part of their programming committee and they are very interested in working with us and partnering with us to create a program for the Amherst Neighbors um, organization. And so I wanted to say uh, today we had one of the programming members of, was in the audience today and was going to be available to answer questions, but um, our meeting took a different turn today. So I will be back in touch with them and I will invite them to come to our next meeting so that we can have that conversation. So if there aren't any other questions or comments, uh, yes, Dr. Shabazz. You're muted, Dr. Shabazz. For those in the audience, we, we are reading uh, the documents that AACE sent along to us. We do appreciate them. The color of wealth study in particular is, is very interesting and uh, as well as the recommend, some of the recommendations uh, for preserving the history of the free people. Um, and, and I do hope we will continue to uh, incorporate some of those in future discussions. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we'll carry that information over in our packet for our next meeting as well. Um, okay, so I am going to adjourn the meeting at 3.44 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Um, happy holidays, happy new year, and we will see you soon.